Welcome to the Infinite Lunchbox, where we are making sense of this moment. I'm Stephanie Lepp, and today we're going to talk about how science builds public consensus, especially in circumstances of high stakes and high uncertainty, like the coronavirus pandemic. And in order to get there, we're going to dive into the concept of post-normal science. Here we go. So science is amazing at building public consensus, except when it's not. Think science on climate change, vaccines, and the coronavirus. In these cases, the stakes are so high, the bodies of knowledge are so complex, and the political divisions run so deep that science just doing its thing results in each side defending its own version of the science and a failure to reach public consensus. In other words, in circumstances of high stakes and high uncertainty, Thomas Kuhn style normal science just ain't gonna cut it. But if not normal science, then what other types of science can we rely on? And I don't mean types of science like physics and chemistry and biology. I mean, what other types of science can we use to build public consensus? Well, philosophers of science Silvio Funtowitz and Jerry Rivets offer us three types of science in this regard. Normal, aka applied science, professional consultancy, and what they call post-normal science. So let's talk this through. In circumstances of low stakes or uncertainty, we're all good with applied science, which involves smaller numbers of scientists practicing what we consider to be normal peer-reviewed science. In circumstances of medium stakes or uncertainty, we need professional consultancy, which also involves non-scientist experts like doctors and engineers. And in circumstances of high stakes or uncertainty, we need post-normal science, which engages the broader public in collecting data or constructing hypotheses or otherwise participating in the scientific process. The basic point Funtowitz and Rivets are making here is that as uncertainty or stakes get high, science must become more democratic. In cases like climate change and coronavirus, in order to build public consensus around the science, more of us need to participate in the process of producing it. And broader participation doesn't just help build consensus, it can actually improve the quality of the science because a greater diversity of perspectives is brought to bear on the issue. Now, whether or not you agree with the specifics of the diagram, you might at least be able to get behind the instrumental question post-normal science is asking, which is, under what circumstances do we need what type of science in order to build public consensus? And if you've been following along with the Infinite Lunchbox, yes, this harks back to the episode on integral theory and strategy. Post-normal science is basically an integral strategy for science that seeks to build public consensus. And with that, some takeaways. Takeaway number one. Post-normal science was developed 30 years ago, but it kind of amazingly anticipated the science crisis we are having today. Yeah, as you may or may not know, we are currently in the midst of a crisis of science, which started with quality control and reproducibility, but is ultimately about the public's capacity to trust what scientists produce. And post-normal science essentially helps scientists build the public's trust. And so thank you, Silvio and Jerry, for anticipating the science crisis that was coming and giving us a tool for navigating it. Takeaway number two. Something I find kind of astounding about the post-normal science diagram is that even when uncertainty is low, as long as the stakes are high, we are in post-normal territory. Meaning we can feel very confident about our certainty on a given scientific issue, but if there are major social implications of that issue, then normal science won't be enough for the public to trust the science. And these days, when it seems like everything has become politicized and the stakes are often high, we are often in post-normal territory, and therefore, more often than not, 
needing to meaningfully engage the public in the scientific process. Takeaway three. You know how climate science pretty much does nothing to convince climate deniers? Yeah, so I think we're pretty much past the point where even post-normal science can help deniers trust legitimate climate science. But, but, <laughs> I do think if we'd done post-normal climate science 20 years ago, like before an inconvenient truth associated climate action with Al Gore and the left, I do think we would be in a different place today. I think if climate scientists had spent fewer resources doing applied science in Antarctica and more resources doing post-normal science with small farmers and flood victims and even gardeners, I think we would have much broader public consensus that climate change is a veritable crisis. Takeaway four. Let's talk about coronavirus already. Okay. Here's the deal. So the stakes with coronavirus are obviously high, public health-wise, economically, politically. The science is still uncertain. We still don't have consensus yet on how many people have the virus, are not the number of people an infected person is likely to infect, the mortality rate of the virus, whether people develop immunity after being exposed, and whether the virus will mutate. All of this to say, coronavirus is in prime post-normal territory. Meanwhile, we have the perfect storm of a global pandemic landing in a crisis of legitimacy for science. Coronavirus landing in a moment when our trust in science and experts in general, at least in the US, is at somewhat of an all-time low. And the folks who've been instigating the science crisis, without naming any names here, are perhaps saying I told you so a little too loudly right now. They're using the lack of scientific consensus around coronavirus to amplify the alarm about the science crisis in a way that's not necessarily helping us deal with the public health crisis. And thus, the coronavirus is the perfect opportunity to practice post-normal science. The epidemiologists leading the charge can, and in many cases are, engaging other experts like psychologists and virality modelers. Epidemiologists can also engage lay people, for example, to anonymously self-report their symptoms and aggregate data while our testing capacity grows. And there are apps for that, like Opendemic. They can engage stakeholders who will be severely impacted by different courses of action like service industry workers and working parents of young children. Epidemiologists and policymakers together can engage the public in a broader conversation about goals and values and trade-offs. What groups should be tested and treated most urgently? The elderly, the young, pregnant women? What businesses should the government assist? Big businesses, small businesses, self-employed people? And I know we don't love to think about this, but given the scientific uncertainty, how do we strike a balance between lives saved in the short term and potentially many more lives sent into unemployment and homelessness in the long term? When the dust settles, I think our coronavirus experience will have revealed to us in full relief the inability of the publication model with peer review and a paywall, aka normal science, to deal with post-normal circumstances. And therefore, I don't even want to call it a silver lining, but let's just say coronavirus might help usher in post-normal science, might help us better use science to build public consensus. Final takeaway. You look a little concerned, so I just want to speak to what you might be fearing a little bit. I know post-normal science might seem scary, and it might seem like opening up already politicized fields of science to even more people might make things worse. But science has always been political. Think back to Copernicus trying to convince the Catholic Church that the Earth revolves around the sun. It's not whether science is political, but how. The relationship between science and policy has always been tenuous. It's never been straightforward. And for most people, science is a leap of faith. 
science is a leap of faith because most people don't actually have the specialized knowledge to verify most science. And so the public actually needs to trust scientists and other experts in order to take that leap. And it's precisely by engaging the public that scientists can help us take that leap and address the politicization that's pushing us into post-normal territory in the first place and help us navigate through this crisis of science and ultimately this post-truth moment. Science being under attack doesn't mean we shouldn't criticize science and just double down on the same way we've always done things, nor should we go off the postmodern deep end and decide there's no such thing as scientific truth anyway, so we might as well just give up the entire operation. On the contrary, we should criticize science in the interest of making it more resilient with an esteem for science, with an esteem for science's capacity to build public consensus. And if the notion that high stakes or uncertainty require a more democratic science sounds ambiguous or far-fetched, well, Silvio Funtowitz and Jerry Rivets are definitely not unique in calling for more citizen science, or more broadly for more sovereign sense-making but I think they are unique in inviting us to shift from we need more science to under what circumstances do we need what kind of science? To which they and I would respond, these days, we need some post-normal science. And that was post-normal science as presented by The Infinite Lunchbox. If you enjoyed it, please, like and subscribe on YouTube, give five stars on Apple Podcasts, share on social media, and be in touch in the YouTube comments or on Twitter at Steph Lepp. Thank you.